rest. Those were the words spoken by General Robert E. Lee upon hearing of the death of Lieutenant General A.P. Hill on April 2nd, 1865. It is fitting that we are here today to pay tribute to General here, Hill here in Culpeper, Virginia, the city of his birth and now the site of his final resting place. Yes, his final resting place from now here. till forever Hurrah. and what brought us here today a prophecy a prophecy made in the printed ap hill monument unveiling program may 30th 1892 in richmond virginia it says general ambrose powell hill with his sword called a name that will live as a center of heroism and patriotism when the monument which overlooks the scene of some of Hill's grandest achievements shall have crumbled unto dust. The monument stood for 130 years until it was torn down on December 12, 2022. It is here in Culpeper that a young A.P. Hill received a special gift from his mother, which he kept with him all his life. A ham bone. Yes, a ham bone, a good luck charm. Why a ham bone? Why this ham bone would remind him of home, family, and Virginia. Today is January 21st, 2023 the 199th birthday of General Stonewall Jackson. But today, we honor General A.P. Hill. General Hill has been known as Lee's Forgotten General. But not today. Not here in Culpeper. Not here in Virginia. Let's talk about his life. Ambrose Powell Hill was born November 9th, 1825, in Culpeper, Virginia. While he was growing up, his mother would read to him. She would read Shakespeare and military histories. Among his favorite people were Alexander the Great and Julius Caesar. He would wear red going into battle, a red cape, a red sash. He wanted to be just like them, leading men into battle, wearing red, so his men could see him on the battlefield. His father would take him hunting and fishing, horseback riding, all the things that Virginians love to do. <coughs> they were merchants. They didn't own any slaves. Now, at the age of 16, yes, 16, Ambrose Powell Hill, he gets accepted at the United States Military Academy at West Point. And while there, he would have his ham bone with him. He will always carry it with him. Home, family, Virginia. While at West Point, he would meet fellow Virginians, such as Harry Heath, George Pickett, and yes, the man whose birthday is today. Thomas Jonathan Jackson. Well, A.P. Hill will graduate in 1847 and go off to Mexico. In Mexico, here's a description of him. He wore a white, wide sombrero. He had a flaming red shirt. On him, he had two pistols, a large artillery saber, two revolvers, and a large butcher knife. A.P. Hill was ready for action. Well, on campaign in Mexico, and then he would go to Florida. He could be on campaign there in his flaming red shirt. After those campaigns, he would come back to Virginia, but then there would be war clouds over the country. And A.P. Hill would leave the United States forces and go to Virginia and be with the Virginia forces, and then the Confederate States of America. 
that first great big Battle of the War will take place on July 21st, 1861, Battle of Manassas. And it would be Colonel A.P. Hill, commander of the 13th Virginia. Virginia! Virginia! Yes, the 13th Virginia, many troops in that company came from Culpeper. Well, after Manassas and Colonel, he would go on in February of 1862 and be promoted to Brigadier General. And then a few months later on May the 5th at the Battle of Williamsburg, he would distinguish himself so much that he would be promoted to Major General. June 1st, 1862, Robert E. Lee assumes command of the Army of Northern Virginia. And A.P. Hill christens his new command, the Light Division. It is the largest division in the Army, and he trains it for speed. Speed, get there in the right place at the right time. Yes, the Light Division. Well, there's a threat to the capital of the Confederacy, which is Richmond, Virginia. And everyone knows at that time, if Richmond falls, Virginia falls. If Virginia falls, the Confederacy falls. That threat is federal forces commanded by George McClellan. Well, there will be a series of battles series of battles known as the Seven Days Battles, right around the capital. It was on to Richmond, that's what those federal forces would say. And on one of those battles would take place on June the 30th. Battle of Frazier's Farm. Yes, during that battle, A.P. Hill would be in his red battle shirt, and there would be a gap, a gap that would open and it would make a gateway right to the Confederate capital there in Richmond, and A.P. Hill, We'd be on his horse. He would grab a battle flag and wave it up. And he would cry out, if you do not follow me, I will die alone. And they followed him. And they closed the gap. One eyewitness saw A.P. Hill. They called him the God of War. And all this was being witnessed by President Jefferson Davis and General Robert E. Lee. You see, they wanted to go on the battlefield for a closer look, just to see what was going on with all the action. But artillery was falling around them. A.P. Hill saw them. He rode up and he started calling out to them, General Lee, President Davis, I am commander of this side of the field. You must leave at once. Go to the rear. Well, President Davis and General Lee looked at one another. They smiled and then they rode to the rear. But did they stay there? No, they kept firing, they kept riding and riding and then more artillery started going around them. A.P. Hill again would ride up to them. President Davis, General Lee, if one artillery shell hit you, then this country would lose the President of the Confederate States of America and General Lee, our commander of the Army of Northern Virginia. Well, they did leave and the battle ended, and so did the Seven Days Battles, because George McClellan and the Federal forces retreated back to Washington. Just think, ladies and gentlemen, what might have been, but because of the timely arrival of A.P. Hill, Richmond was saved, Virginia was saved, the Confederacy was saved, and let's not forget, President Jefferson Davis and Robert E. Lee were saved. Thanks to the timely arrival of General A. P. Hill. Well, the war would go on and there would be a battle not too far from here. Not too far on August the 9th. Battle of Cedar Mountain. Yes, some people will call it Stonewall Jackson's victory, but no, no, it would be A.P. Hill's victory at Cedar Mountain because he would save General Jackson. General Jackson, I know this is your birthday today, but we must give credit where credit is due. And it is General A.P. Hill's victory here at Cedar Mountain, not too far from Culpeper, his boyhood home. 
And the war continues on after that victory at Cedar Mountain. And then there would be the Battle of Second Manassas. At Second Manassas, A.P. Hill will hold the line. And there would be another great Confederate victory. But then there would be the capture of Harpers Ferry in the western part of Virginia. Yes, Harpers Ferry, that arsenal, a great Confederate victory by Stonewall Jackson and A.P. Hill. At that victory, there would be the capture of 12 Yankee prisoners, 13,000 stand of arms, 73 cannon, 200 wagons, all for the take. But General Jackson would ride off to Maryland, to, Shakes, to, to Sharpsburg, to hook up with General Lee. But he would leave A.P. Hill behind to parole all those Yankees. But then early, early on the morning of September 17th, 1862, a courier would arrive to General Hill. General Lee needed him. General Jackson needed him. You see, throughout the course of that day, Lee and the Army of Northern Virginia would be being pushed back, pushed back at the cornfield, at the Sucking Road, and at the Lower Bridge. But A.P. Hill in his red battle shirt, he will have his men, the Light Division, 5,000 men on the road, and with the point of his sword, he would keep moving and moving and moving, and men would start falling by the wayside, but no, he would have the 5,000 men on the road and kind of go through 17 miles in seven hours just to get there. But there were reasons why he wanted to get there. Yes, he wanted to save General Lee and the Army of Northern Virginia, but there were other reasons. You see, he was not too happy to be being left behind paroling those Yankees. So he wanted to prove to General Jackson, yes, I saved you at Cedar Mountain. I am going to save you and the Army and General Lee at Sharpsburg. Also, there was another person that he was going up against. The commander of the Army of the Federals was George McClellan. It seems George McClellan and A.P. Hill were roommates at West Point. And believe it or not, ladies and gentlemen, they courted the same woman. And she ended up being engaged to General Hill. But then the engagement was broken off and she married George McClellan. So A.P. Hill wanted to prove to Ellen Marcy who was the better man. And finally, ladies and gentlemen, one more reason why A.P. Hill wanted to get to that battlefield as quick as possible. He was going up against an old friend of his from the old army, General Burnside. General Burnside, a Yankee, A.P. Hill, a Virginian. Well, A.P. Hill, he came from merchants. He was wealthy at the time, but Burnside was a notorious gambler and he borrowed $8,000 from A.P. Hill before the war and he never paid him back. So, that was another reason why A.P. Hill wanted to get there, but now, He's getting closer and closer and closer. He would lose 500 men going over Boltless Ford. But he would ride ahead, ride ahead. And Lee and Hill would embrace when they saw each other. And Robert E. Lee would give the directions to A.P. Hill for what part of the battlefield he wanted the Light Division to come. A short while later, a column of soldiers were coming closer and closer and closer. And Lee asked his aide, what flags are they flying? And his aide said, they are flying the Virginia and Confederate flags. And it was General Robert E. Lee who said, it is A.P. Hill up from Harpers Ferry. So that expression, up came Hill, became legend because A.P. Hill got to the right place at the right time and saved the Army of Northern Virginia. And as A.P. Hill would say, my men are out, allowed nobody to get by us. Our men with a yell of defiance made it to the battlefield not a moment too soon. Well, after the battle of Sharpsburg, the armies would fight again at Fredericksburg on December the 13th, 1862. And it would be another great Confederate victory. But then you go into 1863 and then at the Battle of Chancellorsville. General Jackson and General Hill are reconnoitering the battlefield at night. And all of a sudden, there's a burst of fire. Jackson gets hit. A.P. Hill sees what's going on. He leaps off his horse, got lies flat on the ground, gets up, he sees Jackson on the ground, and he goes up to General Jackson. And with General Jackson there, he takes off the blood sunk gauntlets. He unbuckles the saber belt. He actually cradles General Jackson's head. And then General Jackson is being taken away by the stretcher bearers, and A.P. Hill will go to General Jackson. I will keep your accident from the knowledge of the troops. And Jackson says, thank you. That is the last communication 
between General Jackson and General Hill. So Jow, General A.P. Hill will command the second corps, but then he gets hit in the back of the legs. He cannot move. And Jeb Stewart, the eyes and ears of the Army of Northern Virginia, will command that second corps and win a great victory for Robert E. Lee. But, but, that victory was costly. See, ladies and gentlemen, on May the 10th, General Jackson is dying from pneumonia. At 3.15 that afternoon, yes, that Sunday afternoon, Jackson always wanted to die on the Sabbath. General Jackson, his final words would be, order, A.P. Hill to prepare for action. Let us cross over the river and rest under the shade of the trees. After the death of Jackson, A.P. Hill will be promoted to Lieutenant General. General Hill will be promoted to Lieutenant General. And now, with Lieutenant General James Longstreet, you had a three corps army of the Army of Northern Virginia going up north. Robert E. Lee wanted to put an end to this war. So on July 1st, 2nd, and 3rd, at a little town known as Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, the war would rage for three days. A.P. Hill's men would attend the first day of battle, and by doing that, he would win a victory. A small victory, but it was a victory. And the Yankees fled to town. But the war would go on, the battle would go on on July 2nd. And on July 3rd, Pickett's charge. Yes, two thirds of those troops belong to A.P. Hill, the Pickett Pettigrew Trumbull charge. That day was the, uh, the charge of the Confederacy going into the center of the Union line. But, but there were issues. So at the end of July 3rd, Robert E. Lee needed someone to bring the army back to Virginia. That evening, first, he would go to the tent of Lieutenant General James Longstreet. Then, he would go to the tent of Lieutenant General James Yule. Finally, he would go to the tent of Lieutenant General A.P. Hill. Lee had to make a decision. His decision was to trust the army to lead the army back home to Virginia to General A.P. Hill. The next year, 1864, Battle of Rage here in Virginia. U.S. Grant will be the new commander. A.P. AP Hill will fight at the wilderness in May of 64. But June the 3rd, June the 3rd, President Jefferson Davis' 56th birthday. Robert E. Lee and A.P. Hill wanted to give the president a special gift. Well, it seems there was a series of trenches designed by General Lee and flanking those trenches was the artillery of General A.P. Hill. And when General Grant ordered his men to charge further and further and further, getting closer and closer and closer to those trenches, that's when A.P. Hill let loose that artillery. If you're familiar with Alfred Lord Tennyson's poem, The Charge of the Light Brigade, you will know while the men charge and Grant's men charge, A.P. Hill gave the order, cannons to the firing, cannons to the right of them, cannons to the left of them, Cannons in front of them, those Yankees were blasted away by the artillery of General A.P. Hill. It was a great Confederate victory. It was a victory as a gift to President Davis. Well, after the Cold Harbor, there would be a nine month siege from June 1864 to April 1865. During that siege, every time 
Those federal forces tried to break through. A.P. Hill was there, because he was the only person who General Lee could depend on. A.P. Hill was not well at this time, but he knew what was expected of him from General Lee. April 2nd, 1865, A.P. Hill could not sleep. It was, it was after 12 that morning. With him at headquarters, he had his wife, who was seven months pregnant, and his two little girls were in the next room. But in the distance, he heard cannon fire, and he had to go to General Lee's headquarters. So instead of putting on his red battle shirt, he would put on a white linen shirt, which his wife had made for him. And then he put on his shell jacket, and then his cape. And in his pocket, he had the ham bone. Yes, the ham bone. Home, family, Virginia. Well, he would go over there, Lee's headquarters, General Longstreet would be there. General Hill would have his two couriers, Sergeant George Tucker, his chief of couriers, and Trooper Jenkins. But then, but then there would be a break, and word got that A.P. Hill's section of the defenses was broken, and those Yankees were breaking through. And so A.P. Hill got in his horse champ and started riding on the Boyden Plank Road, but just getting so much away from the headquarters. General Lee would cry out, General Hill, take care of yourself. Well, it gets to be 5.30 that morning, and light is starting to shine through the trees. But still, General Hill has to get to General Heath's headquarters to rally the men. Maybe one last rally. But then they would see two Yankees on the road, and A.P. Hill and his two Corys would have their weapons drawn and command them to surrender, and they did. So those two Yankees would be brought back to be interrogated by General Lee. Trooper Jenkins would bring them. And so now it would be General Hill and his chief of couriers, Sergeant George Tucker. Now it got to be 6.15, and then they would spot a company of Yankees on the road, too many for them to handle. So then by 6.30 that morning on April 2nd, they would ride through a wooded area. And for some reason, General Hill said to George Tucker, if anything should happen to me, you must report it to General Lee. At precisely 6.30, going through that wooded area, they spotted two Yankees behind a tree. Those Yankees lifted up the 58 caliber Enfields. Those Yankees were Corporal John Mark and Private Dan Wolford of the 138th Pennsylvania. Hill, again with his pistol drawn, called out for them to surrender. But the two Yankees fired. The bullet fired by Wolford, missed both Hill and Tucker. But the bullet fired by Corporal John Mark, came towards General Hill, severed his left thumb. The bullet kept advancing into General Hill's heart, ripped through his heart, came out the back. General Hill was dead before he even hit the ground. But Sergeant Tucker, Sergeant Tucker remembered General Hill's last order if anything should happen to me, you must report it to General Lee. So Tucker would grab A.P. Hill's horse hand, champ, and ride it to the headquarters. And then Lee knew when he saw Tucker riding A.P. Hill's horse. And when Tucker told the news of the death of General Hill, General Lee, as tears swelled in his eyes, and in a choking voice, he said, he is now at rest. And we who are left are the ones to suffer. One week later, on April 9th, Robert E. Lee could no longer go on without General Hill and the Army of Northern Virginia. It was only a shell of its former self. So on that April 9th, 1865, General Robert E. Lee surrendered the Army of Northern Virginia. But that's not the end of A.P. Hill. Five years later, on October the 12th, 
1870, Robert E. Lee is dying from a stroke and his family had gathered around him. And General Lee's mind was wandering back to the battlefield. And just before he says his final words of strike the tent. Yes, General Lee called out. He needed a savior. And what did he call out for? What did he say? He said, tell A.P. Hill, he must come up. <laughs> yes, even the animals knew. <laughs> <laughs> well, ladies and gentlemen, this is the fourth burial of A.P. Hill. You see what happened was that after he was killed, they wanted to bring him to Richmond, Virginia and bury him in the place of heroes, Hollywood Cemetery. But the Yankees were going through the city. They were able to find a coffin and you could not bury him in Hollywood. Then they wanted to bring him to Culpeper, here, his hometown, where he could be buried with his family, his mother and father. But Culpeper is over 100 miles away. And A.P. Hill is not going to be embalmed. So they decided to bury him on the 4th of April at a small cemetery, the Winston Cemetery in Chesterfield County. So he's buried there without any military honors. Two years later, they move his body to Hollywood Cemetery on the side of a curb in Hollywood without military honors. Well, there is a push from Hill's men, the men of the Light Division, the men of the Third Corps, to do something special for the general. It was the A.P. Hill Monument Association, and they raised enough money to erect a monument. Eighteen ninety-one, his body was removed from Hollywood Cemetery and brought to the base of this monument. No military honors placing him on the ground at the base of that monument. Next year, on May 30th, 1892, with the monument completed, on that Memorial Day, 15,000 people showed up to honor General A.P. Hill. Yes, there were military services, but there weren't any when they put him in the ground to three times altogether. But at that meeting, the 15,000, they heard a speech. The keynote speech was General James A. Walker. And these were his words. Wherever the headquarters flag of A.P. Hill floated, whether at the head of a regiment, a brigade, a division, or a corps, in camp or on the battlefield, it floated with a grace and a confidence and courage into the hearts of all who followed it. It was every advance, never, ne nearest the enemy's lines, ever at the post of danger, always in the thickest of a fight and trailed in the dust of fewer defeats than any flag in the Army of Northern Virginia. Finally, ladies and gentlemen, the most fitting eulogy was probably by Colonel Charles Venable of General Lee's staff. You heard these words earlier. You're gonna hear them again. It's worth repeating. In him fell one of the knightliest generals of that army of knightly soldiers. On the field, he was the very soul of chivalrous gallantry. In moments of the greatest peril, his bearing was superb and inspiring in the highest degree. The name of A.P. Hill stands recorded high 
on the list of those noble sons of Virginia whose roll call grateful memory will ever answer, dead on the field of honor for the people he loved so well. Ladies and gentlemen, it all started here in Culpeper. Home, family, Virginia. General A.P. Hill has come home. He is now at rest.